ਕੋਰੀਆ ਮਿਸ਼ਨ ਟੀਚਰਸ ਟ੍ਰੇਨਿੰਗ ਸੈਂਟਰ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਚੰਡੀਗੜ੍ਹ ਅ ਸ਼ੀ ਇਜ਼ ਅ ਬਾਇਓਲੋਜਿਸਟ ਬਾਈ ਟ੍ਰੇਨਿੰਗ ਐਂਡ ਹਰ ਰਿਸਰਚ ਏਰੀਆ ਹੈਜ਼ ਬੀਨ ਪਬਲਿਕ ਹੈਲਥ ਹਾਇਰ ਐਜੂਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਫੈਕਲਟੀ ਟ੍ਰੇਨਿੰਗ ਐਂਡ ਸਾਇੰਸ ਪਪੂਲਰਾਈਜ਼ੇਸ਼ਨ ਸੀ ਹੈਜ਼ ਬੀਨ ਦ ਰੈਸੀਪੀਐਂਟ ਆਫ ਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਅਵਾਰਡ ਫॉर ਹਰ ਫਿਲਮ ਔਨ ਟ੍ਰਿਬੂਕਲੋਸਿਸ ਕਨਫਰਮਡ ਬਾਈ ਸੀਐਸਆਰ ਨਿਊ ਦਿੱਲੀ she has a working uh, experience of working with more than 5000 teachers and for mentoring more than 100 professional development program in addition to writing research papers book chapters book review article creative writing and pieces so indeed uh, it is really a pleasure and honor to have such a uh, uh, learned uh, resource person here uh, for this uh, today's session so on behalf of dr baba saheb ambedkar marathwada university ugc malgaon mission teachers training center i welcome uh, jenti datta ma'am and now i would hand over the session to her over to ma'am thank you very much thank you very much for inviting and allowing me to speak to the different colleagues from different places i would just like to re- ask you that um, can they unmute themselves and speak uh ma'am uh, uh, you, they can raise their hands because okay, problem then. is that when uh, it uh, mm. number goes are above 100 no one or mm. two uh, will open their mic and that will disturb the lecture okay so you are a co-host we will uh, ask them to raise their hands you can ask them to raise their hands mm. and you can uh, unmute them being a co-host right. okay thank you so much because what i want to intend is Uh, though the number is very big but all of us understand that uh, these programs are being conducted on online mode because of uh, many constraints and so that more we can reach most of the most of the people most of the colleagues in different colleges and university across the nation therefore these programs have been kept online for the convenience and for other logistic issues but online mode is a compromised mode we all understand this and academic discussions cannot be done uh, in an online mode because most of the things that you can do online is disseminate some kind of an information but these platforms are not created these discussions nep sensitization and orientation it is not just for uh, information because if it has been for information it it actually we don't need any platform for information because every teacher can go and read the policy for himself or herself it is written in english it is also available in hindi and other languages so you can always uh, go and read the policy yourself so what is the need for having these 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 sessions then so in these sessions actually what we want to do is to bring up certain issues and place them in front of our colleagues for thrashing so that we ultimately come to a consensus we have more sensitization awareness about what is there in the policy as well as we are also kind of ready or uh, uh, ready to take this challenge of implementing the nep regulations in in our colleges or in our universities or departments or classrooms so that is the main objective of this uh, this all this whole discussion and therefore i would like to uh, keep i i have certain disclaimers before i begin i we would uh, rather have an interaction two three types of interaction can be done one of the interaction can be that i ask you to write something on the chat you can write it on the chat the second is you can raise hand and i can unmute you and you can speak so these two ways we will be using very frequently so the my first question is uh, uh, there are certain disclaimers that i place before you do you know what are disclaimers have you heard of this word before yeah please raise your hand my question to you is
Yes, anybody can raise hand or you can write on the chat if you know the meaning of this. So nobody is raising hand. Would you like to write on the chat then? Are there people in the group who do not understand Hindi at all? Okay. Right. So role number 49 says, Jo claim nahi kar sakta. Right. Actually, it is very difficult to have this kind of conversation. Okay, uh, so friends, uh, in, in disclaimers, I think all of you have read this word in the serials, in television serials, in movies, books, policies, and different platforms. So a disclaimer means something that you do not claim, you take away the claim. Similarly, what I place before you is, I hope you know the topic of my presentation or discussion. The topic is student diversity and inclusion so i would be talking about these uh, th this topic uh, in the context of the nep and in the two sessions and uh, because as i said let us try to make the disadvantage of this online platform into an advantageous one and that we can do only if we have a very interactive session so interaction can only be done either as i said you can write on the chat or because I would like to perform it in a workshop mode or in a question answer mode. So it would be great. I would be very grateful if you could just raise your hand to speak and you would see that it will become a vibrant platform. So of course, uh, I also do not claim that these, these two sessions will be highly, very much uh, technical sessions. They would be very much research oriented sessions, but this would be a general discussion on how we can uh, contribute our lot in the in in this theme as teacher and as uh, em, uh, employees as as people working in the higher education system. So uh, again, as I said, that it would be an interactive session. We would do small thought experiments, small question answer sessions, and so that to make it a very in vibrant session. And um, I would also say that if you do not learn anything after the end of these three hours then the onus is on you and it is not on me, right? After my disclaimers, are you ready to go with the session? Okay, right. Okay, you can also send, I think, you can also send. Yeah. Right. Do you all know how to raise hand? Yeah, Dr. Sunita Kalnar. Do you know how to raise hand? Can you raise hand, please? Yes, by using reactions. Yes. And also, all of, they have given you these numbers. This is also very frightening. There is no, there are very less names. Most of the people are identified by numbers. Yeah, by using reactions. There are these three dots in which you can use the raise hand issue. So if you raise hand, I'll unmute you and we can speak. So friends, my first question to you is,
and I would request you to raise hand. Yeah, anybody please raise your hand and give me the definition. Yes. Yeah, poverty. Yeah. Poverty yeah. means, ma'am, uh, uh, person if he cannot uh, afford to satisfy his uh, basic needs. Very good. What is your name? My name is Madhura Joshi. Okay. Okay. So Madhura ji is saying that uh, if a person cannot. Uh, cannot fulfill their basic need, then that person is poor. Anybody else would like to uh, add to this definition? Yeah, lower your hand, Madhura. Yeah, anybody else would like to speak? Because we really want to have a discussion on this topic and I want your responses for that. Okay, if you wish, you can write on the chat also. Do you know how to define poverty? Okay, you raise hand. 138, where are you? You just raise your hand. If you raise your hand, I'll unmute. Yeah. Yeah, 191. Just a moment. No. Yeah, 191. You one... can speak now. Hmm. Yes, madam. Yeah. We can yes. define poverty as the one who doesn't have a shelter, not yeah. enough having the sufficient resources to buy the uh, whatever the uh, daily necessities. So we can say that the, the person is uh, poverty. Right. So that is poverty. Poor, we are not... below... hmm. Right. So, what is your name, sir? Vasant Jhende. Thik hai ji. Vasant ji. Right. Okay. Thik hai. Thank you. Or anybody else? Okay. Re... Number one has raised hand. Uh, hello, madam. Yes. Uh, poverty means, madam, uh, the people uh, lack to satisfy their uh, basic need. Right. BG Maske is saying that, that is yeah, when you yeah. cannot satisfy your basic need. Right? Uh, yes, ma'am. Number 142 now, can you? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah. The person or the family who cannot satisfy or fulfill their requirements against their income. 
वेरी राइट ओके वट इज योर नेम रूपाली अम्बेकर ठीक है जी थैंक यू सो मच सो वी हैव गॉट फोर रिस्पॉन्सिस है सो ऑल ऑफ दैम मोस्ट ऑफ दैम सेड दैट इफ अ पर्सन इज नॉट एबल टू सेटिस्फाई देयर बेसिक नीड नाउ द प्रॉब्लम इज दैट द प्रॉब्लम इज दैट इट इज वी हैव टू एक्चुअली नाउ वेन वी से दिस थिंग देन वी हैव टू डिफाइन द बेसिक नीड्स ऑल्सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल आई हैव सम पीपल आई लिव इन पंजाब इन वेरी प्रॉस्परस इन चंडीगढ़ विच इज अ वेरी प्रॉस्परस स्टेट and some people here say that bmw is my basic need so can a bmw be a basic need and if a bmw cannot be a basic need then uh how do we define because then government actually what happens is government tries to give some kind of a subsidies or some kind of benefits to poor people or poor students then they say that there there must be some kind of a criteria by which poor people can be identified so for that identification what is the criteria that they are using what is the criteria that the government is using yeah please write on the chat or speak to survive on monthly income right actually you would agree that poverty is an abstract concept right what is the hindi word for abstract yeah what is the hindi word for abstract yeah amurta very good yes madhura you are right it is amurt or which does not uh, think some th things which do not have any form right amurt so now when some such thing has to be defined when something which is formless or non tangible has to be defined and it has to be brought at some kind of a quantification right we all know that poverty is an abstract word abstract means something which does not have any form and because it doesn't have any form so it is very difficult to actually catch hold of that concept for catching that concept government keeps on having different kinds of commissions what do the commissions do there are different experts who are there in the commission and then they find out on the basis of their research on the basis of their studies they try to find out some criteria or parameter which tells us that um uh, which tells us of uh, some kind of a way in which the poverty can be quantified so there was uh, so there are different commissions which the government has been uh, has been uh, uh, employing for this kind of a work so one of the commission said that uh, let us have the criteria of uh, calories so if a person can eat so many calories then he will be poor and otherwise he will not be poor but then there is another definition which is now a days going on and it says that if a person is not able to spend rupees 29 in a day in rural area and rupees 31 in a day in urban area then that person is poor so this is the definition now if this is this is the definition by which it goes so it is not about so when the government says that a person who is not able to spend so it is not about the income but it is the purchasing power so poverty is defined by the purchasing power of a person so in these rupees 29 which is in rural area and 31 in urban area right so now let me ask you for a challenge i would request you 
who would like to take this challenge that you have to spend one whole day by spending not more than rupees 29 I hope you get my point. My question is that who out of you, who among you would like to take this challenge that you should be able to spend one whole day without spending more than rupees 29? Okay, 191, Basant ji, Dr. Basant says that I accept. But I would request you, I would ask you that to just, I'll unmute you. Yeah, can you speak? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So let me ask okay. you. Huh. Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Tell me. Bataye. How do you how do you plan to spend the whole day? No, madam, it is absolutely a controversial issue because it's 29 rupees, nobody can uh, stay uh, with uh, they cannot afford to take any meals or anything right. to survive. Very good. Uh, it's a true, it's a totally false statement done by the government, and it is again under the uh, this thing. Uh, uh, under again, the correction is going on in that. Okay, fine. Because I accept that. I I am I fully agree with you that let us not have rupees twenty nine. Let us have rupees fifty or what? What? Uh, how much? You would you be uh, under your idea or your opinion? What should be the level? What should be the limit? Per person, 200 is the 200. basic requirement. Yes. Okay, very right. Per day, right? So, yes. but I, I know there, there must be debates going on. As I said, that the government keeps on having this commission because these criteria are also again revised again and again. So, 29 might, maybe the government has uh, give, made it rupees 39 now, but not more than that, right? But the definition yes. still stands. Now, let me ask yes. you, as you yourself said, that it is not possible for a person to actually spend rupees 29 in a day and live in that, right? So it is unimaginable. But according to the government statistics only, do you know what percentage of our population is poor? What is the percentage of people in India who are poor? People can Maybe write on the chat also. Yes. 10 to 20. Government says that it is 30%, right? Government says that it is 29%. But there are other other non-governmental agencies also which says that it might be very high. But let us take the con the, the conservative number and which government says that let us say that 30% of our population are poor. So if 30% people are poor, then also it is still a very huge number. 30% of 140 crores is a very, very huge number. So these people are... Uh, are so poor that they are not able to even spend the basic minimum, which we think that it is quite unimaginable. How should we do not even, we cannot imagine that how would a person who can spend, who has a purchasing power so low, how that person will be surviving. Right. So my next right. question to you is, who uh, is, uh, who, uh, who is organizing this program? the university okay and who, who is funding the university it's the mhrd the and who, is funding, who is funding the central government by our taxes of course it is the people's money so let me ask you this question and it is open to everybody else how how why do you think these people who are poor and cannot spend rupees 29 in a day should be interested in spending money on this kind of an NEP sensitization program? Absolutely no. No, they are spending. Why they are why do you think they are spending? What is their idea? What is their idea? Hmm. Why they are why their taxpayers, why these poor people's money is being spent on the NEP sensitization program? That is again an issue, madam. Mm -hmm. Because the one who is not contributing to the nation, mm -hmm. if the person is earning 29 rupees, mm -hmm. if he calculate the money, mm -hmm. so he is not 
paying the taxes also oh of course okay. of course they are paying the taxes they are paying taxes everybody pays taxes right they are not paying the direct taxes according of course to the they are not it, paying the direct taxes they are paying the indirect taxes but still they are paying taxes. right and yes. whatever small contribution even from rupees 29 that money yes. it is their portion also when we are spending yes. of course any program it needs not only it needs the contribution of money it needs a contribution of time of effort so why do you think we have created this system in which the society is spending these poor people's money also on these kind of programs to educate them and to come into uh, and make them to come into the um, into the system of skill learn skill learning and uh, they can uh, they have the uh, capacity to earn more right what you are saying is that when these teachers will be trained and they would know about nep they would become sensitive and aware about this nep 2020 ultimately the poor people will benefit correct this is what you are saying so everybody yes, other people also agree to this do you all agree to this okay 142 says yeah rupali ji also says that he, she agrees maske ji is also agreeing okay but you would also agree with me that this is a very long shot when the government thinks or when people think that let us bring the teachers let us improve the quality of the teachers and let us sharpen the minds of the teachers then finally it will percolate down into the classroom and from there to the students and from students to the society do you think that it is as simple as that that it, it don't Normal. you think yeah it's not it's not that simple right first of all yeah. all the time effort money and that we are investing in these programs it is a very long shot that ultimately it will it will contribute towards the welfare of the society it might but we Uh, we, it is only a theoretical thing we do not know how ultimately it will happen right you agree to this no yes right. ma'am okay so now if we agree to this then what is our duty during this program and what is our duty after this program during this program i is my personal opinion that if we get aware the people the poor people and let them come into this uh, uh, system so that they learn the skills and they will be able to fulfill their requirement right these are the basic needs they can fulfill okay. so everybody will get some some job since mm -hmm. it is said that the india is the most uh, youngest country right okay so uh, this might be the one of the reason that the uh, central government has planned in the future that the our um, we will be the uh, skill based provider to the uh, right. to the world world right. okay theek hai bilkul so what you are saying is that uh, investing money in these programs is good because ultimately it will go down to the people people will get more they will become employable and finally they would get jobs so that their lot is improved right but what should we do as teachers during this program and what should we do after this program so that this goal is achieved yeah yes other people who would like to answer yes my question is what is our duty then what should we do because ultimately what happens these days these all these lectures will be will just go away will just pass all these days will pass so finally uh, when we go back into our educational institutions 
the uh, primarily as i said in the beginning that the online program is in itself a not very impactful program so secondly when you go back to your classrooms it will again be the routine thing so what is it that we can make a difference with how how can we make a difference yeah please people can raise hands i don't know don't you think it is better to have an interactive session Okay, right. Basanji is saying that implementation of NEP to get benefited to all classes of the society. That is right. Okay, let me talk to Dr. Basant only then. So, Dr. Basant, what I am trying to say is that how what you are saying is what should we do during the program? This is my question. Okay. One ninety. Yeah, yes, madam. Yes, please. So, so madam, my uh, according to me, you have to, the place where I am basically uh, teaching or where I am. Right. So basically, look after look after to the that area that uh, the, that area. What are the potentials? Um, for them, the right. people will get uh, proper opportunity, work opportunity, and the skills which we will be uh, giving to them that will be beneficial to them in mm. all respects, in mm. uh, in all respects, and also um, to see that the everybody, uh, all the classes, the privileged class and all the underprivileged class get into the uh, system. And they get, uh, benefited the financially, monetary, and also their uh, standard of living will be enhanced. Right. Very right. So what you are actually trying to say is that we have to, during the program, during the program, what should we do? You have not answered that. But what you said is that we when we implement uh, this thing and then we find that most of the people they get some kind of a skill training and finally they get uh, they can get jobs and then their financial condition will improve right this is what you are saying yes ma'am okay so my uh, what i would suggest is that during the program what we have to do is actually uh, note down Maybe practical. right note down some of the things that we really want to implement in our classrooms we have to note down in actionable points, right? Actionable point means we have to note down the logistic of the thing. It's not an airy-fairy thing that I learned here. But actually, because as I said, that if all of us have to just learn the, learn the theory or just learn the policy, the policy is there. I would also like to ask you and to give this uh, question to all of you that how many of you have read the policy? Have you read the policy? Yeah, you can just write on the not, chat. Not entirely, madam. Not entirely. Actually, the policy is a very short one. And uh, it's only 60 pages. And out of which 30 pages, around 30, 40 pages are for school education. And only 20, 25 pages are for higher education. So if you do not want to read the whole document, you can just focus on the higher education because it is always good i would rather say that how to first of all let us understand how to engage with the nep document we i think we should all as teachers first of all read the document 
because it's written also in a very simple language it's written in very simple it's no no nothing technical nothing jargonistic or nothing very bombastic words have been used it's written in a simple language and all the pointers to do things uh, have been given in the policy it would be very good that instead of listening about it from the third person we would rather go to the policy and read it we need to read it as teachers we need to read it as citizens of the country and we also need to read it as employees because ultimately as employees as parents as an intellectual as a researcher all of us need to actually go through the document so if you go through the document so what i am trying to uh, present before you is that all of us all of us need to realize that we have to so if you go if you read the policy or even if you do not read the policy you will realize one thing that it is the teacher who will have to implement the policy teacher at various levels right whether they are teaching in the college whether they are in the management whether they are in the administrative committees or the curriculum making syllabus making committees or in any committee wherever you are or ultimate even if you are at a higher level as a principal as a member of the management as governing body members of uh, higher education systems as administrative holding senior professors holding administrative um, duties everywhere it is ultimately the teacher who has to who has to deliver otherwise there are some duties of the government also for or the state government for example they will have to give funds they will have to approve the regulations etc but substantial part of the work of implementation of nep will be done by the teacher do you agree to this yeah all of you do you agree to this yeah okay so if we have to de if we have to do this thing it is better to actually engage with the policy it is, what does it mean engaging with it that you are listening to the sessions here of course you are listening i am sure that uh i feel a little disappointed when people do not even open their cameras and very much disappointed by these numbers because it is very difficult i am growing like insane on speaking to the laptop without looking at people and without getting any kind of a uh, thank you very much yeah without getting any kind of response from the people right so uh, friends uh, what we are discussing is that uh so if teachers have to actually implement it then we have to as i said we have to engage with the thing so firstly you have to read the document you have to think about the document you have to reflect on the document so when resource persons are coming so that you can have better discussions with them and you can have uh, you we can actually talk about the problems in the implementation but what happens that in in absence of uh, people's uh, even basic awareness about the policy it is we are not actually talking about the implementation we are stuck at the level of uh, giving awareness or giving sensitization and just telling about what is there in the nep right so then what we have to do about implementation is that there are certain things that you should do when you go back to your classrooms so that things you have to write down now when you are listening to the resource persons there would be certain ideas that come to your mind aapko bahut sare aise ideas aayenge jo aap samajh sake ki ye wali cheeze hum classrooms mein apne kar sakte hain these will be very uh, these can be ideas about uh, as teachers you can do wo aap apne aap se kar sakte hain teacher as teachers you will be able to do so we are discussing hum wo wale baat yahan pe bhi karenge jo teachers khud se khud apni class mein implement kar sakte hain lekin wo tabhi ho payega jab aap uske liye uski taraf uh, you are ready to do right you are ready to actually uh, to note down aap jaise main jaise koi bhi session hoga to okay so my next question to you is 
the classrooms which you attended as students were those diverse राइट मेरा क्वेश्चन आपसे ये है कि जो क्लासेस आपने एज अ स्टूडेंट अटेंड की है क्या वो क्लासेस वर दोज क्लासेस डाइवर्स वी आर टॉकिंग वी आर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट डाइवर्सिटी राइट सो लेट मी या प्लीज आंसर दैट दिस टू मी यू कैन रेज हैंड और यू कैन या राइट ओके वेरी गुड ठीक है तो मैक्सिमम लोग यही कह रहे हैं हाँ डॉक्टर राजेंद्र यू वॉन्ट टू स्पीक ओके सम पीपल आर सेंग नॉट दैट मच राइट सो आर द क्लासेस दैट यू आर टीचिंग मोर डाइवर्स ओके राइट यस ठीक है तो ये इसका रीजन ये है यू यू आर वेरी राइट दैट इफ यू लुक एट अ मूवी राइट इफ यू लुक एट अ मूवी मेड इन 1947 एंड यू लुक एट द इफ देर इज अ मूवी अबाउट कॉलेज लाइफ और कॉलेज स्टूडेंट्स देन व्हाट काइंड ऑफ पीपल डू यू सी इन दैट मूवी are there many women are there many disabled person are there pe poor people in the in the college are there uh, different kind of uh, from marginalized society are there people from marginalized society in the college what kind of a demonstration do we find in the movies of 19 of maybe early uh, pre uh, post independence yeah mostly men very good Yes, yeah, Sagar Kishte is writing. Yes, very right. You are right that most of the time, what we see that the that the there are mainly Indian males, male and males of higher caste, and also from privileged section, from elite families, from rich families, right? But now, when we go to the classroom, we find that our classrooms are much more diverse, right? Because higher education has moved on a journey it has moved from being elitist being from a higher uh, uh, from high people from a more higher uh, economic uh, uh, economic backgrounds they were coming into the higher education earlier but now we have seen that people from uh, all backgrounds are coming from higher to from uh, underprivileged from middle class women are coming disabled people are coming people with different kinds of orientation they are coming into higher education so there has been a journey from elitism to massification right so we see that after 1990s almost we see that from elitism to to being elitist 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 elite Just to towards massification of higher education. This is what we see, right? So as more, more and more and more people are now coming into the colleges, so of course the diversity would be more. let me ask you do you know about this thing what is this
have you talked about ger in your sessions Yeah, okay. Dr. Basant, you are bringing him in a doubt. Right, we will talk about it. Let us first of all talk about, yeah, that is what we need to discuss and we need a very open discussion about how NEP will be implemented, implemented or if really want to thrash these ideas. Yes. So, um, Madhura has told me that it is about the gross enrollment ratio. I hope all of you know that the gross enrollment ratio means that all the population, the whole population of India, which comes from 18 to 23, out of that, what percentage of students are coming into our classrooms, right? Do you have an idea? What is the percentage of students who are coming into the classroom? Just give me a guess. Okay, Sagar Kishteji. No, no, no. This is huge. Right. Okay. Okay. Very right. You see that, yes, yes. It is very much necessary that as teachers, we must have an idea of this. It is actually 27% presently. Right? And finally, the government says by 2035, it wants to bring... Right? So, this is the goal. By 2035, it wants to bring 50% of the students in higher education, which again is a very, uh, I would say it is a very uh, ambitious plan, right? Because presently it is only 26.7 or 27% students are coming to the uh, out of 100%. So, you can say that very only one fourth of the population or one third of the population is actually coming into higher education. Rest of the students are out of higher education, right? So, uh, now, so even then, even then it is huge number. The new number is very much and uh, depending upon the population, right? So, the, the our classrooms are now having more and more diversity in the classroom. So, having is answer me this question is having diversity in the classroom yeah answer me this Okay. Sushil ji, Dr. Sushil Patil is saying it is good. Okay. So, everybody is saying that it is good. So, why is it good? Very good. Yeah, Dr. Madhura is saying for social awareness and empathy. And what are the other reasons? Why do we need to have diversity in the classroom? Okay.
ओके हायर एजुकेशन परसेंटेज विल इंक्रीज स्टडी ऑफ सोसाइटी वॉट आई एम आस्किंग इज नॉट परसेंटेज नॉट अबाउट इंक्रीजिंग परसेंटेज वाट वी आर या डायनेमिक टीम बिल्डिंग एंड होलिस्टिक लर्निंग वेरी राइट ओके, राइट स्टूडेंट्स बिकम मोर ओपन टू आइडियाज वॉट एल्स right okay so we have we have given some reasons of why diversity is good the reasons are like this that we say that social awareness and empathy will increase there would be dynamic team building holy more holistic learning will take place students become more open to ideas there can be different perspectives in the classroom the classroom has more enriching discussions the students will also learn uh how to how to behave in the in the society when they get down after their education when they go to their workplace and they have to deal with the diversity then student will also it, it would also be a practice for the students to learn handling de dealing with the different diverse kind di diverse people with different backgrounds and student will become more social and they will get more ideas right so now what does di diversity but what so all of you said diversity is good so what does it mean for the teacher what does it mean for the teacher yeah dr sushil it is interactive but i would have liked if you would you could all have spoken okay so yeah let me uh, let me ask you this question what does it mean for the teacher right yes people are giving their right right okay so sagar ji is writing the students will the diversity will make us improve in all aspects right teachers can share knowledge and learn from different but is it difficult for the teacher or easy does it become more difficult for the teacher or does it become easy okay sagar ji is writing improvements are not always easy of course it would be very we would be very happy if there were only one kind of students in the classroom so that there are no challenges and it is very easy and we are in our comfort zone right of course it is difficult for the teacher it is actually a challenge for the teacher to deal with the diverse classroom but we are now dealing we have already started to deal so we have to we are yeah it will be challenging of course it is challenging 
but we are already into it we are the, the the this generation of teachers who are teaching in higher education in 75 years after the independence of the country when there has been a huge massification of higher education we are already dealing with this challenge india is in itself a very diverse country so whichever whichever classroom we are dealing whichever where from whether we belong to any state any a uh, part of country of course there would be a lot of diversity in the classroom because india in itself a diverse country so we cannot actually escape we cannot actually avoid diversity anywhere so it will be challenging so my question to you is yeah my question to you now will be uh it will be challenging so i what should i ask you now that okay do you remember yeah this is my question do you remember any class which you attended which was inclusive or maybe there was some class which actually excluded you do you remember this such kind of a class if you remember then would you like to share the experience okay let me ask you the first question first do you the classes which you attended were those inclusive classes i will wait for your response okay so sagar ji is saying yes it was inclusive how do you know it was inclusive how do, how does inclusion manifested itself how did inclusion manifest itself in your class how do you know it yes sagar ji how do you know that it was an inclusive class i would tell you about my experience in the school in which i studied that school i was not a local person from there it was a school in a hilly area and all the people there all the girls and boys there were very fair and they were very beautiful and had sharp features but because i was not a local person i was dark and not having good features so i felt very much excluded people would not girl uh, student children would not play with me children would not include me in their uh, in their gr groups and also even teachers would not take me in the cultural programs if there was some kind of a 
drama or some kind of a performance, some dance or something, I was also always excluded. Right? So this is what I am asking that how do you, how does inclusion look like and how does being excluded feel like? This is what I am asking. You have to answer it from the viewpoint of when you were a student. Okay, very good. Okay, let me ask you now another question. Have you ever in your life felt excluded? In anywhere, whether it is as, a, as an employee, whether it is as a colleague, whether it is... Okay, there was no communism or such things when we were students. Okay, right. Right. Dr. Dimple is saying that I studied in Johan Navodhya Vidyalaya. Inclusion was there. Teacher and college were including all this. Right. Okay. What I want you to think about. Right. Yes. What I want you to think about it. When you say that in the in the schools that you studied or in the colleges that you studied, there was inclusion, then you have to give me the manifestation of inclusion. How did how did you understand that it was you were being included? So inclusion ka jo uh, criteria hai, what was that? That you have to write. Thank you. Right, that you have to tell me. How do you feel? How do you know? Right? We have to actually identify those actions which lead to inclusion and those actions which need to exclusion. Right. Very good. Yeah, Sagarji is writing. Thank you. Right, right. Okay. Everyone was welcome to express their ideas and no prejudice. We were forced to participate in all cultural and co-curricular and we were from yes. Yeah, Dr. Dimple, thank you. Because as you wrote Jawahar Navode Vidyalaya, which, which has a culture of having diversity, it is kind of a, a, a practice of intentionally, voluntarily bringing diversity and um, making policies so that there are people from diverse backgrounds in the same class. I think you also have in Jawahar Navode Vidyale, they also have a policy of having a group of students from a totally diverse state, right? For example, in Chandigarh, they have people, students from Odisha. So they teach Odia also and these people are from, uh, these students who are from Odisha, they are studying with the students of Chandigarh. So kind of it is a, a practice in which consciously diversity has been introduced. Right. But usually what happens, but even though diversity is there, still by the practice of the teachers, sometimes student can feel excluded. Right. But sometimes by the practice of the teachers, students can feel included. So this is what I want you to think about that. How do we, uh, what are the activities through which we can exclude people or we can include? People? Right. Chalo, think about it then. Okay. What is the time now? Uh, right. Can we take a five minutes break, please? Okay, we will take the break at uh, four o'clock then. Okay. Now my next question to you is, my next question to you is then, okay, we will take the break at four o'clock, right? So my next question to you is, do you know the profile? of your students. 
Okay, Dr. Ankush, can you write down uh, the profile of your students in brief on the chat? Or Dr. Anand, would you like to, would you be interested in writing the profile of your students in brief? Okay. Well, Dr. Anand, what you are saying is, okay, how do you consider the diversity of students in an interdisciplinary course? Okay. Number 44. Now, what does this mean that the educational is with the office and somebody else is also saying that the class teacher has the details? So, when you go and teach the class, don't you, do you don't, don't you know about your class? Uh, of course we do. Sagarji is saying that yes, we do. We know. Right. Very right. In the admission form, we know that uh, there is this information about family background, caste, sibling, economical condition, educational details. Right. And what they have. Uh, so do I, this is what I am asking you. It is, of course, it is in the education, in the, in the that thing, admission details, admission form. But I would also like to say that as a teacher, is it in your mind, the back of the mind, or do you know about it consciously? Is it like, of course, there are people who are different, but do you have a conscious idea of what kind of students are there in your classroom? I want you to write... A brief profile of your classroom on the chat or maybe in your own notebook if you don't want to write in the chat. This is the exercise that I am giving to you. Right here I am giving you nine different parameters on which the students can be can be can show their difference. The student can be different. Right? Which of them is there in your classroom? Can you write a profile on the basis of these parameters on the chat? I give you uh, five minutes to write. Okay.
Yes, Dr. Madhura has written that in her class, there are people who are from semi-urban places. 30% are women. They are mainly Marathi speaking with Maharashtrian culture. They belong to different castes. Most of them are uh, from Hindu religion. 1-2% to 2 are with disability. Then middle class, they are from different uh, e uh, economic, economic, socio-economic backgrounds, right? So what happens is, Sagarji, what you have done is you have also written uh, a little, but what we want, I you have given us the strategies of how to include them, right? But I want actually, like everybody should write about the profile as Dr. Madhura has written. Maybe if you are not writing now, you should write it in your notebook or you should at least know it when you go to the classroom. What happens is when I am in the HRDC, so we often invite resource persons from different places. So there are two kinds of resource persons. One, the first resource person, when I ask them to speak to our audience, speak to our participants, they just tell me that this is my topic and I am going to speak on this. Right? Give me the date, give me the time. There is a second resource person. When I ask him that whether if you can come and deliver a lecture, take a session with our participants, that resource person would ask me, who are your participants? Are these teachers? Are these young teachers or old teachers? Are they from science background, from commerce background or from arts background? Are they from Chandigarh, Punjab or from different states? Would they uh, be able to understand English or would they like to uh, ask me to speak in both languages? What is their expertise? What is their need? What do they want to learn? What are their expectations? So they ask me different questions. Which resource person do you think would be more effective? The first one or the second one? Of course, very right. Uh, everybody would say that it would be the second one, right? The letter. Now the question is, what the first one, the first resource person is only interested in his own delivery. He is totally teacher-centric. That, oh, I, 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 I know this. I am an expert of this. I will go and deliver it in the classroom. Whosoever wants to benefit from it, they will benefit. Otherwise, I don't bother. But the second one is more, more interested to actually tailor made his presentation, his delivery, according to the needs and expectations of the classroom. And of course, the second one would be more effective. You have very much rightly identified. So now this is the question I ask from you, that how much closer do you know your students? How much do you know your students? And how do you know? What are, the, what are your strategies to know about your students? One of the things, as somebody said, that it is in the admission form. But do you read the? Do you really read the admission form? Do you keep in mind? Do you have a profile of the students very consciously planned and structured and written down, right? So that you can apply your mind and find out different strategies to actually include everyone. For example, there would be certain things which are not obvious in the admission form. For example, learning style, even disabilities. Some, there are some physical disabilities which you can identify on the face. But otherwise, there would be hidden disabilities which you would not be able to know. In addition to these, there are different intelligences. You also must be knowing that students have, everybody have different, some people are intelligent in music, some are intelligent in sports, some are in uh, making things, some are in mathematics, some are in language. So there are different kinds of intelligences also. Do you have an idea of what kind of things your students are better in? What is their, uh, what makes them unique? Right? So, yeah. So, let me ask you this question that what is your method to know them better? What is your strategy to know them better? So, 104 is saying that plan some activity to know them. Of course, you can plan some activity to know them. But are you doing already? Are you using some strategies? then you can share those strategies with the group. Right? I'll wait for you to write down one or two strategies that you are already doing. If you are already doing, if you are not doing, then it's you can start doing it now.
yeah, fifty eight is saying that an entry point questionnaire is administered to students after they are admitted, and a database is thus created. Right, very good. I hope that that database is shared with the teachers so that they can uh, tune, that they can tune the fine tuning of their teaching. They can be able to fine tune their teaching according to the data. Also, we have a talent search activity where all participants to showcase their talents. Yeah, very good. I think that is a very good strategy if you are already doing it on the basis of the organization. We conduct meetings with their teacher guardian. Yeah, yes, Sagarji, that is also a good uh, way. I think from all these discussion, what we have to find, what we have to actually zero in or implement in our classrooms is that one either your college or your institution can do some kind of an activity, a structured like a questionnaire or something, which is floated among the students and shared with the teachers, or other or maybe like in Dr. Sagar's classroom or institution where. You have meetings, close group meetings with small number of students so that you know their know the, know them better as persons. So what is targeted? What is the target? What is the objective is? The first thing is the teacher must know the students. That is the mantra. Yeah, introduction from students, likes, dislikes, right? So the first thing is know your students. And Many teachers say that, uh, oh, we have, we know them through the admission activities or we usually, uh, we know them. But I would say that you have to make a very strategic, a planned and a structured art strategy. You have to use a very structured way to find out about the, the diversity, the diverse profile of your students. In fact, you can create a profile and you can keep, your, keep it in your file. If you can keep it in your portfolio. And when you go for interview or when you go for some, uh, when you apply somewhere or when you write your bio data, you have to write down that what kind of diverse classrooms you have dealt with. Because that is also a teaching experience and a teaching competency. If you have dealt with diverse classrooms, big classrooms, different classrooms with lots of diversity, and you have been a successful teacher at that, I think that would be a great uh, added uh, added uh, qualification that would be an added um, added eligibility or qualification or a more uh, I would say um, uh, something which people would like to be associated with right so you can keep that profile also as a badge of honor for yourself so that you can tell other people that how diverse classrooms you have dealt with so this first mantra is to know your students when we know our students, not only technically, but also that we know them as persons. We know their motivations. We know their, where do they get the kick from? What is their agenda? How can they use their agency? Then we are more likely to help them in getting their education or, because, or facilitating their education. Right? I will stop here for uh, five minutes. Now, uh, five minutes are still there. So in these five minutes, you have to give me a feedback of this session or any comments or any ideas that you have. And after that, we will have five minutes break. So I'm waiting for your comments on this session, right? Okay. Please give me your comments on this session. And if any ideas are there so that we can discuss them in the next session.
thank you very much for your praise but what i would like to know is uh, comments on the session right comments on what we can do more what are the things that you would like to discuss about Okay, friends, then let us take a break for five minutes, uh, tea break or water break, and then we again resume our session. So don't go away. Uh, okay, of course, you can go away for getting your tea. Thank you very much.
Okay, so welcome back, friends. Let us begin with the second part of the presentation. So now, uh, what we did in the last session was that that it is imperative for the teacher to know about their students so that they can fine tune their personality according to the di different uh, diverse their diverse backgrounds and to reap the benefit of the diversity because as we said that for uh, it is very all of us agreed that diversity is good for the classroom diversity is good for education it is good for the students so in order to reap the benefit of that diversity we have to actually take these steps and be first the first thing is that we have to know our students so now this is done let us say that the teacher knows about the students and you have made a very comprehensive plan a strategy to find out you, about your students as persons as peoples you people as ident you identify them as different individuals as unique individuals with different potential right then the second step is do your now my question to you is do your students know you? Yes, what is your answer to this question? Okay, right. Yeah, please let us have some more responses. Yes, please. Other people can also answer to this question. Do your students know you? And if yes, how? Right. What is the method? How do they know you? Right. So, Dr. Abdhut is saying that yes, they know but, and through direct contact in the class. Direct contact, that means you are teaching in the class. It does not always ensure that you know the teacher. Right? Do you think that it ensures all the time? Even if we are we teaching the uh, and the students are learning from us, they are being taught by us. But do you think that is enough or that is uh, adequate for the students to know you as an individual? Okay. So then what should we do? Right? Because again, it, it is a mutual contact. It is a mutual rapport that we have to build. So when the teach, when we know the students, our teaching becomes better. And when the students know the teacher, their learning also becomes better. Right? So we have to approach 
from that angle we have to approach and make us make, make ourselves known to the students right usually what people say is that what are the methods let me ask you first of all one of the things as dr abdul says is direct contact what are the other ways in which the students know the teacher right yes very good right but are there yeah via virtual classroom via virtual classroom you do not know anybody you cannot know right okay so uh, yes as you said that of course the students also know us and there are different ways of knowing one of the ways is first of all when they look at us when they watch us or when they observe us in the classroom dealing with things conducting ourselves through how we dress how we speak how we conduct ourselves are we fair or not do we uh, enforce discipline equally or not whether we have favorite students right how do we um, what are the things that we prefer so all these things they are indirectly observing and making an idea about you right the second way is through uh, the uh, how how you are teaching so the second way many people say that it is on the college website the information about the teacher's qualification or education is given and also you in some colleges there are orientation programs or induction programs when the new students come the teachers are introduced to them also right there is another way in which they know about and that is from their seniors because every teacher has an image also and from that image from that image uh, that 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 uh, reputation that reputation also travels and the new students are told by the old students or their seniors that this teacher uh, will be very strict on the first day but then from the second day onward she will not even come to the class or this um, teacher will give you a lot of homework but they will never check the homework again right so these kind of information it passes it is a rumor mill it goes around and every and people know students know about you but that is not the way or that is not the information that we really want to pass on to our students what i want to pass on to our my students is what kind of teaching i will do in the classroom what kind of a teacher i am and I how should you know. behave in my classroom so that get the be maximum benefit out of it. so what i have done is yeah dr sushil patel okay so uh, in uh, in my in my classroom what i have done i have created a one page document in which i have written the rules that i want to be enforced in my classroom for example i tell my students that you should not worry about the examination i will make sure that you get good marks in the examination examination is a by product the main product or the main goal of education is to improve your knowledge to sharpen your skill and to improve your attitude if you work on all these three parameters and you have to focus on only that you focus on the discussion that we are doing do not focus on the examination i will ensure i will make sure that you get very good marks in the examination and i also tell them that you have to submit all your assignments whatever assignments i give you have to give it by the due date that i have given i will not extend the date i will not take any assignment after the date similarly i also give them the tentative dates of the examination that i will be taking throughout the semester i also tell them about what are the parameters on which i will do the evaluation right i tell them about the fun activities that i plan to do i also give them my email or my other information so that they can contact me and i also tell them that i will not give them if they can come late in my class but i will not uh, give them any extra attendance or uh, false attendance but if they come late in my class that is also allowed i will allow them in the class but not giving giving give them any kind of fake attendance 
So even these rules or um, rules about the mobile phones or rules about how to behave with the other students, what are the things that I expect from the students, these are all written there. So that, that one document, one page document, I give sometimes to the students, they can get it photostat it, or they can click a picture of it and keep it themselves. What happens when, and I also tell them that I will not give you any notes, right? I will, we will discuss and you can make your own notes, or I will give you small pointers on which you can develop and make notes. So these are some of the ways in which I tell them and they know about how to learn in my classroom because you are a teacher, you are a, also a unique teacher. Every teacher is a unique teacher. Every teacher has a different style of teaching. But we have to make the students know that how should they be, they learn in my classroom. What are the things that sh they should keep in mind when they are in my classroom? So through that, they learn about the teacher and it becomes a, the repo establishment is very quick because if, if we really want to be effective teacher and really want to bring the benefit of diversity into the classroom, then we have the first thing is to build credibility, trust and wrap. I'll stop here for a moment and take your comments. Yes, please. What are your comments about what I just said? That is the student should also know the teacher. Yes, What I am asking you is, you have to actually comment and give me your strategies of what are your very uh, structured and thought, thought, well thought strategies on how should the students know about the teacher. Or how do you do it in your classroom? These are the things that I am asking you. Of course, as Dr. Abdhut, you have said, and earlier also Dr. I think Sagar has also said that when we, um, there are many occasions in which teachers and students are together. For example, in during the extracurricular activities, sometimes during the educational trips, they get a glimpse of our personality, which is not the classroom personality. But what I am asking you to do is to have a well thought, well thought out planned activity so that the students come to know about what kind of a teacher you are, right? This is my uh, advice. This is my advice to you.
ओके राइट सो व्हाट अबाउट हाउ आई टोल्ड यू द थिंग दैट आई टोल्ड यू हाँ of course dr dimple is saying that we make a small introduction about ourselves on the first week of every semester yes that is very useful but again as i said that 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 introduction should not be limited to only your educational qualifications but and they should it should not be a dry introduction but it should be kind of a motivational thing you can also share share something in your life which has motivated you or your struggle or how you have reached the reached here it can be a very personal kind of information also so that the student can connect with you and also give them some tips on how they should be how they should behave as students in your classroom i hope i am clear in it i hope i have conveyed the message that i wanted to convey and you have understood right dr manasi is also saying that as we teach them through different activities or through interactive sessions then we could understand the students well and vice versa of course right so there should be more uh, right uh, what i'm saying is don't just leave it to that the students will ultimately learn about the teacher but you have to be proactive in that approach and make it in your an agenda make it in your timetable that you should have one session or half a session in which you you tell the students about yourself in a way which is motivating inspiring and also help, uh, help facilitates the learning of the students right so i so now we come to the so we have talked about two maxims to about two mantras one of the mantra is the teacher should know the student and the third and the second is the student should know the teacher now my third question to you is डॉक्टर सुशील पाटिल ओके या दिस इज माय क्वेश्चन टू यू डू योर स्टूडेंट्स नो इच अदर yes dr abdhut when you say that yes your students know each other how do you ensure that
Yeah, people, teachers are telling us, colleagues are telling us that one of the ways in which his, uh, to do this is to place them in different groups for class activities by rotation so that everyone gets to know everyone. Now, there is one important, just a moment, moment, moment please. Yes? Yeah, I'll call you later, please. So, uh, yeah, but the important thing about this is, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, number 58 is saying that placing them in different groups for class activities by rotation so everyone gets to know everyone, right? Now, one of the very important thing is you might have observed that the students will ultimately know each other, even if you don't do anything. But... You might have also observed that if you don't do anything actively, then the students will make small groups. There would be different lobbies. All the rich students will be together. The poor students will be together. Students of one caste will be together. Students of same religion will be together. Girl students will be together. Boy students will be together. And there will be many, many small groups of comfort. So these groups, they would be making on the basis of their comfort because nobody wants to be in a group in which there are people from uh, backgrounds uh, who are not familiar with them, right? So there are other kind of people. So we don't like to be, uh, to get out of our comfort zone. So we really congregate. We, we uh, get attracted to people who are from the same background and who are like ourselves only. So therefore, when you do, you have to actually consciously do it by rotation. By rotation means that in a, put representatives of different groups or different kinds of people in the group and then rotate them also so that everybody finally gets to know everyone. Right. And Dr. Abdhut is saying that uh, we have paired the students. That is also a good activity uh, because at least they know one student who is a different one and you can change the groups also. And also while sports and other activities, they're making groups through collaborative learning activities. Very right. Small groups of students for study and during cultural activities. Yes, these are all very right techniques and good techniques to um, also you can make them sit in the classroom. Uh, you know, on different, with different students, maybe every day or every week, just make them, ma make them uh, aware of this thing that the teacher understands the importance of knowing other people, knowing people from diverse background. And just, you also have to raise this issue. You have to speak about this issue of diversity in the classroom. Just don't do it without telling the students that why you are changing the groups, why you are wanting them to sit with different people every day, because you have to give them the context in which these activities are being done. So what you have to do is you have to tell them about, uh, about the idea of diversity. Why is diversity good and why is it a challenge and what it will ultimately do to people because students will ultimately move out into the society also. So once they learn with to listen to the other people with patience, to accommodate the other people, to understand the people who are not like themselves. So this is a great skill to have because finally, when we are in the society, when we are in the workplace, we have to work in collaboration. So that collaborative skills of collaboration, team skills, these come together. These, these are, uh, these, these also the students can develop, right? So when you raise this issue of 
diversity and uh, make them understand that no kind of trolling no kind of harassment or bullying is will be tolerated in the class on the basis of identities then the students also become sensitive to the issue and also only then we will be able to uh, we will be able to reap the benefit of diversity right so uh, yes are there uh, some other things that you would like to tell about what i said you can just write on the chat i'll give you a moment and then move on Yes. Right. Yes, yes. Mentoring sessions are also very important. Uh, right. Because, and this is also mentioned in the NEP also, NEP document also in the portal that mentoring about this mentoring activity that there is a mentor teacher and uh, there are different students uh, who are assigned or designated to the teacher designated teacher and then uh, that te there is a kind of repo or uh, uh, kind of uh, more intimate relationship with the teacher so that if the students are feeling left out or they are having some mental health issue or any kind of problematic issue they can come to the teachers and discuss things with them now do you see some challenges here we have discussed now three mantras three issues now, do you, what are the challenges of this? Uh, no, no. What are the challenges? Let me ask you uh, some other question. The question is, yes, we have now said that we will develop this kind of uh, relationship among the students, student and teacher. And finally, we will become more tolerant, more accommodating and more understanding and sensitive towards the diversity. Right now, I'm asking you another question the what are the strategies to celebrate now i have to we have to go a uh, one step further right what is that step one step further one step further means uh, the, all these things we are we were doing within the uh, within the regular uh, activities of the classroom can we do can we do something more what are the strategies to celebrate diversity? Now, not only accommodating or sensit getting sensitization, sensitized towards diversity, but now the next strategy is not the now the next step is to celebrate di diversity. What do we do for that? I hope you have understood the question.
okay friends so now i am giving you a many strategies here not to ensure that diversity in the classroom you can deal with that and you can use it as a tool to enhance your teaching learning in the classroom right i am putting it there there is a huge, long list it's a long list so you can please read the list and then come back into the session and then we can discuss right so i'll give you 5 minutes to read the list i don't know if i will be able to put the okay okay it's saying the list is too long let me give you smaller list Can you read this list? Give me some time. Yes, can you read it now? Okay. i'll i'll give you some more ideas so that we can talk about them yes now can you just speak about them or can you talk about them or can you relate to these ideas Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Animesh. Very good.
right yes now we can discuss these things yeah so i'll just now right i think everybody is writing please go through the list properly and if you really because i will not speak any more i have spoken a lot now if you really want to speak you can op i will uh, unmute you you can speak and tell about your experience or your challenges or any question that you would like to discuss right because these points that are these strategies that i am giving to you these are very generic and these are very understandable so i don't think i need to elaborate on any of them so if you really uh, please tell me what do you think Is there something on which you would like to have discussion? Right. I will wait for you. Have you read all the points on the chat? I am waiting for you to comment on these, the points or the strategies that I have mentioned and submitted. If you can relate to them, if you are already doing them, if you can improve upon them or give some new ideas. Because as I said, these platforms are not only one-way platforms. Because if these would be one-way, then you could only go on the internet and find out there is a huge num huge amount of resource available there on how to create inclusive classrooms, how student diversity we can celebrate and how we can bring... So you, you can, everybody can go and read them. So why are we doing this discussion session? We are, why we are doing this kind of a session in which... Because we really want to thrash the issues. We really want to discuss and find out that what, which one of them is actually implementable and what are the other challenges of doing this in the classroom. It's not an idealistic situation that we are uh, trying to uh, create in the classroom. So this, I want your comments or discussion on these kind of ideas. So please, if you have been given a chance, either you can speak or you can write. Okay, let me, I think all of you are very tired. So let me tell you a joke. And if the joke is good, then you have to give me some kind of a reaction, right? Send me some emoji. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Anis is sending an idea that makes students prepared for all the challenges to face. Right. Thank you. So the joke is, the joke goes like this. 
that uh, there is the teacher the teacher is asking in the classroom what is the difference between truth and illusion so the student says that the te teacher you are teaching us that is truth but if you think that we are studying then that is an illusion Yeah, send me reactions on the, you don't have to put it on the chat. You can just send the reactions otherwise also. Good. Thank you. Right. Look at this. You can't even tell. A joke online, right? Thank you. Right. I hope all of you have got the joke and we need to remember this joke all the time because uh, the teacher might be trying very hard and the teacher may be teaching a lot, but it doesn't matter if the student is not. Uh, yeah, we can't assume as number 90 is saying that student was right because we can't assume whether the student are understanding the topic or not. Similarly, I, uh, I am also not able to assume whether all the people who are sitting behind these numbers or be beyond in the in, beyond my laptop screen, are they actually getting my point? They are not getting my point. They are not listening. They are just not there. I do not know. Okay. Yeah, please tell me something. It is not good to speak all the time. Please raise your hand also. You can speak also. Okay, so I come to my next and final question. What are the challenges? Now we talked about different strategies. Okay, so what are the challenges in uh, teaching a diverse classroom? And how can we overcome? Now, this is my question, almost final question to you and you can write the answers here. I will give you two, three minutes for this. Do you think you will be able to implement whatever we have discussed here? Very good. I am very happy that you are saying that yes, you can. Because many teachers, very good. Thank you very much. Because many teachers actually raise certain kind of doubts on what should we do. Right, what that we would not be able to do this in our classrooms because they have, uh, they they say that it's not possible. Yes, right, right, very good. I think I am happy that you brought this idea of the language issue. Now, how do we deal with this language issue in because in India this language issue would always though it is in other countries also, but it is more uh, in India. It's quite uh, I would say. Uh, normal. It is normal to have in a class people who have very different language issues, right? Maybe it is the mother tongue issue. English English problem is always there, right? 
so what if we have a bias in within us then what do we do the only problem is we do not fall ourselves into bias right so yes very good thank you for bringing in different ideas right i am talking about now the language biases in the teachers if we have the language biases then how do we behave in the classroom using language that is dehumanizing or denies the existence of a group or for example teaching something without acknowledging the contributions of groups laughing on a student's name mispronouncing a student's name belittling students who have difficulty with english language right it this 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 happens a lot in our classrooms that mostly what we think is if people speak english then they are very intelligent this kind of assumption actually actually is very bad because if the teacher has this kind of an assumption if the teacher has this kind of a connection in his mind that in case if the all those students who come from english medium schools or have english uh, english language uh, competency they are more intelligent because as we said that in this nep most we also have this idea of teaching in our mother tongue or we we understand that language is only a medium the main idea is to reach or to teach the concept of the thing so we have to uh yeah regional students are unable to understand hindi also right some people are saying challenging for teacher to handle diverse student when given by you will help to overcome number one is language barrier yeah right we have here even uh in 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 one of the universities uh, we have students from afghanistan who understand we have students from nepal from punjab and uh from uh, chandigarh so punjab the students from punjab they learn they know only punjabi students from nepal they understand only hindi students from northeast they understand english and students from afghanistan they have difficulty in understanding all kinds of languages just think about the teacher who is teaching in such a classroom right so it is actually uh it, it is really a challenge how do we do that the problem is that how we have to teach the content also we have to cover the syllabus also and then in addition to that we are being asked that we have to do all these diversity issues things also so what answer do you have to that right also when you say students have different intellectual level of course intellectual level means they have different learning styles we are not talking about the intellectual level intellectual level is actually related to iq right iq of course there can be different iqs of people but it is beyond our control to deal with it because it is something that you are born with but we are we can talk about the learning styles because different students have different learning styles some students learn by listening to other person some students learn by writing some students learn by doing things so when people have different kind of learning styles and they also might have learning disabilities right learning disabilities means uh, though uh, though in uh, i think you have watched that movie tare zameen par in which there was this student with dyslexia that learning disability was uh, highlighted the issue was highlighted but actually it should not come up to the higher education level but sometimes it happens that student with mild dyslexia or some they also reach to the higher education and then your students our students can also have this kind of uh, issue right then we have this understand what is this understanding level understanding level means that some students do not have that perception or maybe the more uh, i think i would say pin pointed cause to this would be that they come from when they come from school or they come from the lower classes they do not have an understanding of the foundational foundational level so if they do not have the the foundational level understanding then they have a difficulty in capturing the next level understanding right so this uh, uh, the, these challenges how can we actually be, de deal with these challenges similarly about i think nobody has written about uh, right uh, people have not written about the challenges of uh, physical disability like if we have you have uh, visually impaired students in your classroom if you have uh, 
uh, if you have other kinds of uh, physically disabled students in your classroom, then how do you deal with it? In fact, a very low self. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, ninety. What is your name, Mister Ninety? Mr. or Miss 90. Right. So, Rida, what you are saying, I think, uh, thank you very much for bringing up this issue because I have some ideas about how to deal with this, this kind of a challenge. Actually, what happens when we have students who are coming from very low uh, socioeconomic background or maybe they are very poor or underprivileged, they have this kind of a helplessness in them. They come to the classroom with very low, and if if of course if they are girl students, then also they have a very low self confidence, and they have, uh, they have this. Right. Yes. Yes. I remember, Doctor Basant. I will come to that. Right. Uh, so we have these, these students who have very low self and esteem and confidence and they think that they are not capable enough. So how do we deal with them? Though I have given you some ideas on this. For example, one of the good things to give to them is some kind of an empowerment. Empower them. Empower them by uh, uh, equipping the students with thinking tools. Right. If you make them think and if you make them logical and if you give them the critical thinking capacities, if you develop their critical thinking skills, the students would be able to actually understand that uh, and, and you develop their agency. Now, what is this agency? What does this mean? Agency. Agency means the power to change things on our own. Right. That every person is capable of changing their own situation or doing something with, through which they can they can change something. They may be in the, they can change the society or bring some kind of a difference. So that we have to make our students understand that they have an agency also. That they can also change their own destiny. They can also bring change in the society. There are small things that you can do. First, one of the things that I said is the giving them, equipping them with critical thinking skills. Also, I think many colleagues have shared their ideas or their activities that they are already doing. For example, if you ask, if you ask these students to stand up and speak or give a speech or ask them to come in front of the classroom and speak and speak, right? Or give them small duties. For example, ask them to write a review of the whole class or a, a summary of the whole teaching that you have done in a in the whole class in one period and then ask the student to stand up and tell about what you have taught right there are there can be many different strategies through which you can empower the student and in which neither any money is needed nor any kind of uh, any even time is not not much time is time and effort is not needed the main thing is that you have to make the student understand that they are capable, they have capacities, they have competencies and ask them to develop their competencies and skills. Uh, I am sure that you, because when I ask, ask the teachers about how do you handle the diversity of students who are from poor socioeconomic background, many teachers tell me that they give the fee of the, they help the student by giving the, their fee or giving them some kind of a financial help. I would say giving, instead of giving financial help, if you may empower them with new thinking skills or about how to use their own agency, how to how to develop, how to stand up in the society, or how to uh, come up overcome this low confidence, less confidence, I think that would be a rather more uh, better and useful gift for the students coming from the low socioeconomic backgrounds, right? Yeah, um, uh, we can empower them by giving them different kind of uh, responsibilities, giving them some kind of accountability in the class, right? Giving them some such assignment that they would be able to do, they would be, and these extracurricular activities, these cultural activities that, that are done in the colleges or different club activities, they are also very helpful in doing these kind of things. Yeah, I would now go yeah, diversity in respect of family background. Of course, the family, because I think the disadvantaged, when, when the poor students come to your class, they are, of course, disadvantaged. The, the research says that 
the difference between a poor child and a rich child the language vocabulary would also be different within 5 years 5 years of bringing up the rich student the rich rich child would have a richer vocabulary more words and the poor child would have a poor vocabulary so these students who are coming from the underprivileged background they are really they need help they need support but then how do we do it within the framework of our duty and within the classroom time that is the challenge and if you really want to do it then you have to uh, first of all be very structured and find out well thought out uh, strategies which do not take much time but if you can plan them ahead and plan them properly then they would not take much time right this is uh, my suggestion to you and yes students from different regions and religions are of course there as i said that let us go ahead and celebrate diversity also celebrate diversity means to consciously adopt and adapt to the uh, others to the other backgrounds so in the nep there are certain ways in which it has been discussed that how we will bring that diversity into the classroom and how the government will help one of the one of them is to give exposure to the students by asking them to go to different educational trips right now educational trips are a part of our college excursion most of the colleges have this kind of a uh, activity in their annual calendar but these trips are actually uh, very useful in exposing the students to different cultures so that they can understand that how Uh, to develop a sensitivity towards and awareness about the uh, other cultures so if we do them in a proper way because ultimately everything boils down to the logistics if the teachers are not doing them passionately then even the good activities also become white stale and dry and students will not learn from them right so i will stop here i think i'll answer to dr basan's uh, question when he said that uh, yes when we are talking about uh, nep 2020 and its implementation if you have read the document carefully you would see that it is a very uh, ambitious document right it wants to bring so many changes and it is as people are saying that it is a paradigm shift that means it is a whole shift from all the all the earlier traditions of 75 years so these all these earlier traditions of 75 years we cannot just leave them in one go also our country is very very big very very diverse and one size fits all will be very difficult to actually implement also implementing the nep ideals would uh, be uh, it would bring of course in the beginning it would bring quite a lot of problems and chaos right and it is up to the teachers or up to people how do we how do we actually handle the nep document but when i look at it so all these logistic issues are there right implementing implementing anything in our huge country and on the top of it something which is very radical as educational reforms or educational changes that is a very very huge challenge and the thing is the the problem is that the challenge has to be taken up by the teachers themselves we cannot just throw it to the ministers or to the bank people or to the hospital to the doctors or engineers we have to deal with it ourselves so one of the thing is first of all understanding the nep in a better way and implementing it in a very wise way that why that wisdom is needed wisdom is very much needed to implement it the second thing is we also need active cooperation from everybody from the government from the society from parents from students right so teachers can do it but they also need a lot of they cannot do it alone so we need from all stakeholders a lot of facilitation support help all these things are needed which again is a challenge in how do we actually get them but the good thing that i find about nep 2020 is it brings many fresh ideas on which we have been talking about and we have been talking about these issues
the issues that we have been the issues that we have been talking about for example the issue of critical thinking how the teaching students critical thinking right or even the indian knowledge system i would say let us not take it as a political agenda let us talk about uh, that in a huge country we have to be very indigenous in our ap approach because our problems whether they are our uh, classroom problems or whether they are our uh, research problems they are not they cannot be borrowed from other countries so we have to be very indigenous in our approach or for example the um, idea of uh, uh this thing about the holistic education about holistic education interdisciplinary education or uh, giving flexibility to the students all these ideas are very good ideas but again as i said with the disclaimer that good ideas need to be implemented in a wise way so how do we do that it is upon us please uh, i would say that engaging with the nep is more necessary that how do we and people as teachers i think we have our own agency we can uh, make a difference we can make a difference as members of the committees in which we are working as teachers ourselves and as as intellectuals because when we think about these things we can create that culture we can create that culture in which the uh, policy would be seen as something which is uh, which is uh, uh, more i would say facilitating to the students because the times are changing and we also have to change along with it right so i hope my answer is some uh, little satisfactory has given you some kind of a satisfactory answer yeah miss 117 yeah you are raising this issue of uh, our education system never considering their background even if whether you consider it or not the education system who is the system who is the system right that is the question whether you consider it or not poor students are coming to the classrooms of higher education and they would be coming to the classrooms of higher education now it is up to the teachers what kind of education do we give to the students most of in most of our colleges we are giving a very poor quality education to the students and it is not because any government or not because anybody else but because teachers are not ready to teach better in the classrooms you can say there are reasons for it there are social reasons for it there are political and economic reasons for it but still if even if half the teachers would be giving a very uh, i would say uh, uh, the right kind of an education to the students they would make the students really employable as you know that there is this issue of employability of our students right and we know that there are we our students are becoming unemployable graduates that means they cannot be employed because they do not know how to do things for example a student who has done ba is not able to write one paragraph in english then who would who is going to employ uh, if a person has done bcom and he is not able to calculate income tax then he would not get any kind of job so uh, we are just churning out students who do not have any kind of they are not employable so that we have to think about it that as teachers what is my duty in my classroom uh, i think of course as i said the teacher alone cannot change the whole system because the system is uh, i i would give you this answer with a small example that in a room there are four lamps when these four lamps are burning brightly only then the whole room gets illuminated one of the lamp is that of the teacher one of the lamp is that of the student one of the lamp is of the society and one of the lamp is that of the institution so even if the teacher is burning very brightly only one fourth of the room will be illuminated but other lamps also need to be to burn but the teacher can help the other lamps to burn also but the prime duty of a teacher is to first of all burn their own light very brightly so i'll stop here and i'll ask you to comment or discuss or put your doubts or anything that you would like to speak just don't say it was a good session because if you say it was a good session then you have to give me a reason to it just don't praise blankly just pray if you give me a praise then also tell me that why was it good 
this is my email and i am available if you really want to continue the discussion we can uh, we can uh, give this i think i will give you Hello. Yes, we can go over to the HRDC. And please, if you can conclude, would you like okay. to conclude the program? Thank you so yes. much, ma'am. So, right. participant, any uh, question? We have already discussed. Okay. okay. Just wait, ma'am. Uh, right. 
हाडू हाडू भाऊ काय काय नको करू एवढे काका so i think that the lecture is over now so i will propose a vote of thanks on behalf of participants my special thanks to uh, jenti datta ma'am for being here sparing her valuable time uh, and conducting this session i'm really thankful to her for uh, uh, this wonderful session and i now declare this session is over and all of us mm -hmm. we will gather here at 2:30 thank you ma'am